Welcome back. In this final segment, I'm going to walk through the various ways that one can write code in Python. First, I want to give a quick overview on the major Python versions that are out there. Python 2 and 3 are very similar. We'll be using Python 3.7, but the major uh, release that happened before uh, Python 2 is still in widespread use because there's so much code that's been written in it. These days, though, it's important to know that there aren't many good reasons to use that older version. Python 3 was released over a decade ago, so at this point, it's very stable. Uh, and the two of these are similar enough that their syntax is actually pretty hard to differentiate. The big difference being print statements, which in Python 3, you'll see require parentheses around uh, what you're printing, while Python 2's print statements don't require parentheses. That's the biggest visible difference. Now, um, there are many ways to write and execute Python code. That's what the slide walks through. The most basic of them is running snippets of code line by line. And in that mode, the interpreter is known as a shell. And you write the code in a command prompt, uh, command line application like terminal on Macs or a command prompt on Windows. So for instance, you might write print hello. And then you hit return, and Python says hello. Right, print three, and Python says three. So line by line. And this way of coding is, is mostly useful for very short tasks where you're just uh, checking something, don't need to save your code. Uh, but the most common and robust way of coding in Python is by writing scripts. Um, these are just plain text files saved with a .py extension. So in a Python script file, you write uh, lines of code that Python will run straight from top to bottom. Hello, three. Now, Python scripts are ideal for longer tasks that require very stable, reliable code, uh, or tasks that you might want to run again and again with only small variations. Um, you can run Python scripts two ways, one using a command line app, um, or more commonly, you might be using what's known as a integrated development environment, or IDE. And an IDE is basically a, a nice looking piece of software, usually has a lot of, a bell, a lot of bells and whistles, um, and those make it easier to organize and debug complicated code. Uh, most IDs are actually free, and we'll get you set up with one uh, near the end of this quarter. What we're going to be using uh, for most of this quarter um, this format known as the Jupyter Notebook. And you recognize those as files saved with an I, uh, .ipynb extension for Python Notebook. A big feature of notebooks is that they let you run smaller blocks of code individually in any order. Uh, multiple times sometimes, and they let you see the results of each code block directly below it, uh, whether that's text like hello3 here, uh, or a graphic like a map or something. They're not great for really big, complicated projects, but they're perfect for most smaller scientific data analysis tasks like exploring some new data or testing out something uh, more preliminary. And the cool thing is that you can run Jupyter Notebooks in your browser, uh, so you don't have to need to, uh, you don't need to necessarily download a full app like an IDE. So I just introduced notebooks. And in this course, we'll be specifically using Google Colab notebooks, which are very similar to Jupyter notebooks. Now, the main difference between these two is that when you run code in a standard Jupyter notebook, it's the hardware inside your computer that's doing the computation. With Colab notebooks, it's Google servers, which are commonly called the cloud. That's what's running the code and doing that heavy lifting. It's a bit like uh, Microsoft Word versus Google Docs, you can think of. Um, so how do you access each of these notebooks? Uh, with Jupyter Notebooks, there's a bit of procedure uh, to get them installed and opened. You don't have to know this necessarily. Um, but uh, with Colab Notebooks, you can see all that you have to do is just open your internet browser and navigate to colab.research.google.com. That's the big reason why we're going to be using Colab for this course. This also means that you need internet to access Colab, so just be aware that you might not be able to write code using the setup while doing field work, for instance. Um, now, Colab will almost always run your code decently fast, but not impressively fast. Jupyter, on the other hand, will run your code super fast. If your own computer is super fast, that's great. The downside of that is that it will run slow if your computer is slow. Another thing to know about Jupyter is that it uh, gives you a few more options um, for customization than Colab, and it handles external packages more easily. Those are kind of nice features to have, but they're not essential for this course. Also, um, 
both of them are free. Though uh, I think it's worth pointing out that Colab might not be free forever if Google decides to start charging for it, which hopefully it won't do in the next 10 weeks. Um, last thing here in these advantages and disadvantages, um, Google Colab integrates with Google Drive. So it is uh, very easy to share your code with a teammate, for instance. And um, that is it. I just want to finish with this slide, uh, which lists most of the resources I used to create this lecture. And you can access these links from the PDF version uh, of the slides if you're curious, if you want to learn more about programming fundamentals. Uh, but otherwise, uh, thanks for watching, and I will see you on Tuesday.